My name is Deb Slaney. I'm the curator of history at the Albuquerque Museum. Um, I, uh, about 10 years ago, I worked on a project here at, at the Hurt Museum on uh, the history of C.G. Wallace and Zuni jewelers from Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico. And I'm here today to talk about C.G. Wallace and about the different artists that he worked with, uh, their influences, but also the, the huge advances that they made in Zuni jewelry in the 20th century. And uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about C.G. Wallace. He was a very interesting man from a large family living in Ellerby, North Carolina. He never went to high school, but he was very interested in education. He was interested in American history and the history of the West. The reason for this is because his brother Mac uh, served at Fort Wingate, New Mexico, and so he was very interested in the West. Decided it as a, at an early age after working around in the army camps uh, about 1918. He got on a train with his wife Catherine, and they, uh, they, they started heading out west on the train, and they basically train hopped through the west, and, um, and they were sharpening saws on the route. That was basically uh, Wallace's main skill. So as the trees got smaller and he ran out of trees to, uh, to, and saws to sharpen, he started barbering on the caboose. And he barbered on the caboose all the way to Gallup, New Mexico. At, at Gallup, he worked briefly as a shoe salesman, and then he moved to Raymond, New Mexico, to work as a, um, uh, as a, as a clerk for the Ilfeld Trading Post in the, uh, in the series of, of posts and stores and mercantiles that they had in the Southwest. Uh, from there, he worked briefly with, uh, ch with Charles Kelsey, and then in 1920, he opened up his own trading post at Zuni Pueblo. So that is how C.G. Wallace got started at Zuni Pueblo. And uh, he was still a very young man. He had to work really hard uh, in a number of ways. One way is that he had to, uh, uh, to get to know the Zuni people and Zuni customs and, and, uh, and learn to adapt to basically be a, a good trader. And you had to be a good trader to live at Zuni Pueblo. In order to apply and receive your trader's license, you had to have letters of reference that indicated that you were of, uh, of sound mind and good conscience. And at the same time, you had to figure out how to run a business that was basically um, designed to, uh, to provide Indian people with the foods and the supplies they needed, but also provide uh, the, the resources such as tools and supplies um, and, um, uh, and, and the product in order to make the jewelry. So a number of jewel jewelers worked for C.G. Wallace, but also a number of jewelers uh, worked at home. And uh, through the 1930s and into the 1940s, except for during the war years, silver was very easy to come by and other uh, products such, such as shell and, uh, and silver, turquoise, the basic products were easy to come by. Uh, but it got more difficult during the war years. And of course, by the 50s, uh, uh, many of the different techniques had, uh, had branched out and there were a lot more jewelers who were working in Zuni Pueblo. And so in the 50s, uh, particularly, it was a really great decade for, for 20th century Zuni jewelry. Um, the traditions of Zuni jewelry go back into ancestral times. And that's really important to understand because many of the materials that you see on the table here, uh, such as travertine, the Zuni stone, turquoise, um, and, and abalone, and, uh, and spiny oyster, for example, as well as jet, are all materials that were used traditionally and um, in, in ancestral times. Some of the shell, for example, um, could be available through the Gulf of California or through the Gulf of Mexico and, um, and were traded into the area through other groups. But um, during the 20th century, traders like C.G. Wallace brought in materials such as coral, uh, which the, uh, uh, the Zuni people were very fond of uh, since the times of, uh, um, of the arrival of the Spanish to the Southwest. And so the coral became a very favored material and, uh, and in some ways may have even uh, replaced the traditional uh, prehistoric materials that were used, such as argillite and, and red shale. Uh, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about the jewelers who worked with C.G. Wallace. Um, there, several styles were very popular during the 20th century. Uh, th this includes uh, carved work, cast work, work made out of cast silver. Um, also, uh, mosaic and channel inlay were very popular. And also, examples of the nugget, nugget style of jewelry making were, were very popular. And so we have some examples here out on the table of, uh, of some of the various kinds of work that were produced at Zuni Pueblo. 
uh, the three carvers who were extremely famous during the 20th century were Likia Deus, and uh, he made this beautiful coral and turquoise nugget necklace that we see here. He was one of the earliest carvers at Zuni Pueblo. He and several other individuals were working at the ancestral Zuni site of Hawiku Pueblo um, in the uh, mid-teens. And that is probably where Likia became exposed to examples of prehistoric fetish work and early carving. Um, although the, the, the traditions of, of that kind of carving, he would not have necessarily learned from the site because it would have been within his culture to, uh, uh, to understand the reasons for making them and how to make them. But he was certainly inspired by, by the kinds of artifacts that they found at Hawiku, and as a result, he became very adept at making fetishes not only for Zuni use, but also for commercial use. And he was probably one of the first carvers who carved specifically for commercial use. Uh, C.G. Wallace was very fond of the kind of carvings that he did. Uh, this cow head, it's actually a bola tie slide, is a very good example of Likia's kind of work. It tends to be very organically carved and often with very beautiful undulating textures and he was also very careful about his inlay, and so you'll notice in this steer head that the eyes are of turquoise and the little star on the, um, on the forehead of the steer is very beautifully worked and carefully polished. Really gorgeous work by Likia. Other carvers included Leo P uh, Pobl Poblano, who was a member of the Zuni firefighting team. Um, and his father was a well-known contemporary artist by the name of Veronica Poblano. So Leo's, wo Leo's work is characterized by, uh, by very fine, uh, delicate, and texturized feather work. And then also, uh, you often see dot inlay on the shoulders like you do in this piece. Um, and you'll notice on this bird, he has a very long, pointy black beak, very typical of Leo Poblano's work, and then uh, a rather high pedestal. Now, Likia's work uh, also has a pedestal, but often it's lower and designed to set into jewelry, where Leo's isn't as, as often uh, showing that kind of characteristic. Um, uh, Likia also did really beautiful nugget work like in this coral and turquoise necklace, um, often in combination with fetishes. Uh, he carved leaves and he was probably one of the first carvers to carve leaves and th that was specifically at the request of C.G. Wallace who believed that, uh, that the carver should be carving what he perceived to be his traditional design elements that were not necessarily traditional, and that includes leaf elements. So often these, um, these fetish necklaces will have, um, have birds and bears and frogs and leaves and sometimes um, uh, pomegranates and other little carved elements that are really beautiful.